Hi, I am watching Science in Plus and this is Romesh Shivas. Please to subscribe the channel for the HR news, for HR updates and conversation with the top now CHROs, thought leaders and business sites. Today we are going to discuss uh, the sexual harassment at the workplace in uh, financial year 2024 especially. And uh, what are the rising trends and uh, what are the challenges at the workplace when it comes to the prevention, how you can say the preventive sexual harassment at the workplace. Joining us, Advocate Jan Bakshi is the founder and uh, managing partner of uh, Swarcom Law and uh, Solving Complexities. And Ms. Samrati Makkar Vidha, she is a co-founder of Equally Brio Advisory. She is a psychologist and advisor and trainer for the Posh. So welcome both of you on Side Simples. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much, Ramesh. Recently, released by the Economic Times and uh, Comply Karo. And uh, the major point of this report is that there is a surge. You can see the increase in reporting cases of sexual harassment cases in financial year 2024. And this increase is uh, around 40.4%. Uh, so my quick question is that uh, how do you see uh, this report? And if there is a surge, if there is an increase, then what are the reasons responsible uh, for the increase in sexual harassment reporting cases? Uh so I think firstly, it's great that we are now documenting uh, the number of cases that are getting reported as well, right? And to be able to also see the trends from one year to the following year as well. And uh, I think when you're looking at the 40% cases, we need to also still look at the absolute numbers. You know, the absolute numbers are still about 268. So if you look at in the larger scheme of things, uh, 268 number of cases being reported significantly more is still not out there. Uh, you know, in terms of when you compare to the prevalence of sexual harassment uh, at the workplaces, that's number one. So we have to also look at the absolute numbers, I would say here, right? And when you really look at the trends of why the surge has really come in, right? There are multiple reasons for it. Second, firstly, would be to look at the, how there has been change in the operating models. We were primarily working remotely, then moved to hybrid. And a lot of people have come back to working from the same physical premises, right? So offline model has emerged again. And this also means the kind of sexual harassment cases that were getting reported earlier were primarily non-physical. So if you look at the definition of sexual harassment, physical contact and sexual advances were not getting covered out of those five types, right? which now after coming back to an offline model, those cases will also get reported. Second, you have to also look at the mindset. When people, people were working remotely, there is a certain degree of comfort that comes in with anonymity, with having no screen, no videos as well. And people would say a lot of things and the boundaries will get transgressed. And one may not even know that they have transgressed these boundaries in the absence of the nonverbal cues because everyone's videos were off. Now, when you have really, and that became the pattern, it, it, cracking those jokes, making certain remarks that may really make, that, that can bring in the experience of discomfort. And that has continued also when people have come back into the offline model. And now when people are noticing those micro expressions, uh, the way it is being said, the tonality of it, people, it's difficult to let it slide because you have to interact with them day in and day out in the same physical premises. You can't just say, okay, I have this two screens distance between the between us and the other person. So now to let it slide has become a lot more challenging, right? So that's the second thing. Third thing when you're looking at greater degree of awareness, when we were in a hybrid model, remote model, the number of sensitization sessions were happening, right? But the, the way it was being conducted, right? And now the way it's being conducted, we are able to really percolate that, that into the system right from the leadership to mid-management to entry level to housekeeping support staff as well. So the percolation level is much higher in this case, which also means the awareness level is higher and people are able to make it easy. It's become easier for people to report to. Also, uh, another layer that gets added here is the fact that if I am confused or unsure that is this really sexual harassment case, I do not want to put that on email. But when you're working the same premises, it's, you know, you know what, hey, this comment was made. What do you think about it? I felt it was not okay, but am I... Exactly. Am I overthinking? Am I thinking too much out here? You're able to really do those check-ins with your peers, managers, mentors, HR leaders as well, which really also then inspires confidence that this is not okay. No one should be experiencing discomfort in organizations. There has to be a degree of safety and respect at all times, which also encourages people to go ahead and file a complaint. 
it's been 10 years since the law has been passed, right? So the mechanisms have become a lot more robust. They are monitoring authorities. Supreme Court has come up with guidelines as well. The fact to really emphasize the importance of creating this awareness, upskilling IC members periodically. And I think all of these have really added to the surge in cases that we're noticing right now. Jen, what is your take on this? And let me also add one more data. So total complaints which are uh, included in this report, uh, I think these are around 932 sexual harassment complaints and uh, by 30 companies uh, in this financial year 2024. Thank you. I think, Sabriti, that was a very, very comprehensive answer. Let me try and add my two cents here. Now, uh, I always want to delve into the details. Now, if this is a report which has come up, first thing first, we are looking at, uh, you know, BSC Sensex, essentially, as you know, Ramesh uh, Samriti is a stock market index. It's an index of 30 well-established, robust companies listed on the BSC, what we also sometimes called as BSC 30. Now, as per these media reports, there has been an increase only in these 30 companies. The report is limited to only a set or a very small subset of 30 companies where they say there is an increase of 40.4%. And as you rightly said, which in terms of numbers, uh, I think goes from uh, 932, it has uh, from 664 to 932 uh, in the financial year. Essentially, it means around 270, 268 is the number of cases which have increased in one year. Honestly, if you if you assume that there have been no major decreases, probably other than Tata Steel. Tata Steel, there is a decrease in the number of cases that has gone from 38 last year to 21, which is great. Other than that, I think a significant portion of this increase of 270 cases can be attributed to only a few companies. And let's pick up only two sectors, banking and technology, for example. Look at ICICI. Last year, ICICI reported 43 cases. This year, 133 cases. 90 cases have increased only in ICICI. Remember, we are talking about the differential of 270 cases. Out of 270, 90 is only coming from ICICI. Let's look at TCS. Last year, 49 cases. This year, 110 cases. 61 cases have come from TCS. If I look at Infosys, which is again, you know, 20 plus Tech Mahindra, 20 plus HDFC, 10 more. If I compare only these five companies, ICICI, HDFC, TCS, Infosys, Tech Mahindra, we can explain 200 cases out of 268 cases that have increased, which is roughly 75%. What has happened in the other cases? What happened to the other probably you know 25 companies or 24 companies that are still we've included? Probably that data is still not available. We do not know much. But overall, we know that these five companies have given us this massive increase of 40%. 40.4%. Really, is that, you know, while it has increased, and as Smithy says, okay, 40% is fine, but it's only 268 cases, you know, that have increased. One data is very clear. More cases are being reported. And the next probably question will be, why? What are the reasons for that? And I will try not to cover the reasons which Samriti has already covered, because those can, are completely true. I think at a society level, and I would probably say that there is a greater attention to the fact that, you know, oh, this is workplace misconduct and a greater emphasis also on the fact that let's create a safer workplace at a society level. Then probably at an organization level also today, you know, several organizations are trying to implement stronger policies, training programs, reporting mechanism and help that way, you know, ensure that at an employee level. Now I've gone from society to company to employee level. There's a growing awareness and also willingness that I will go and report if there is a matter. In addition to this, I will also say that I was reading somewhere that probably there's a data compiled by the Ministry of Statistics and uh, Program Implementation, who are saying that the participation of women in the workforce has increased in the couple of years, last couple of years. Now, this is what they claim. And they and if that is true, then probably, you know, statistically, it directly correlates to probably an uptick in the number of reported cases as well. So probably I'll you know sum it up by saying that whatever may be the reason behind this and which looks to be multifaceted at this point, important point is that more people are feeling empowered to come forward and demand that accountability, which I think is a great positive step. 
Absolutely, I agree with you, Jayant. Uh, you have highlighted two points. One point, uh, you are talking about the TCS and ICICI, the major contribution into this. In TCS, for the 110 cases they have reported, these are not only for the India, this, this includes the global number. And yes, in that uh, is last correct. financial year, 49, that was only for the India. Uh, number two, as far as the ICICI is concerned, 133, that is a huge number if you compare with the last year. Last to last year, it was 46. And last and uh, uh, in financial 21, it was 33. Headcount, that is also very important. Every year, the headcount of companies is increasing. The participation of women workforce, that is also increasing. So the number of cases in, in that ratio, definitely, we can uh, understand that there should be. True. As uh, Samriti uh, was talking about uh, transition from work from home to uh, work from office, yeah, absolutely. This is a, a major contributor. And uh, uh, if we, we trust on this data, so in financial year 2021, we have seen the minimum cases of uh, sexual harassment cases uh, that were reported because it was the complete lockdown, I think, at that time. So, uh, and uh, uh, if you look at the BIPRO, uh, that is not, I think, included mm. in this list. So the number of cases are reduced if you compare pre-pandemic to post-pandemic. I'm not talking about the pandemic period because we cannot compare the pandemic period with the pre and post. So in uh, BIPRO in financial at 19, it was 142 cases and in financial at 20, it was 125 cases. Now they have reported 93 cases in financial at 24. So number of cases are also reduced with the BIPRO. Another company, if you see Tech Mahindra, so in Tech Mahindra, we have seen the increase of number, which was two cases only in financial year uh, 20, means pre-pandemic I'm talking about. And now it is 93 number. So there is a huge uh, you know, a difference in the numbers. So we cannot generalize with the fact that 40% or 50% uh, there's increase in the reporting cases of sexual harassment. But of course, okay. yeah, I think we all agree that uh, because of the awareness and a lot of efforts by the companies, so reporting cases numbers are increasing. That's a good sign. Yeah. Ramesh, one thing just adding here, and sorry, I know uh, I, I'll probably just you know add this one point. Yeah, please. We also have to be mindful about two things. One, this data only represents 30 companies out of lakhs and lakhs of companies in India. One. Secondly, these are only listed companies. Numbers from private organizations are not available in the public domain. And probably Samriti can also you know, come in here. Both of us probably sit as external members for a lot of organizations. And we can tell you the numbers are massive, which are not recorded here, of course, and not available in the public domain. So one also has to look at all those private limited companies. What have happened there? Have those numbers increased or decreased? But again, those are not available in the public domain. So it's very difficult to have a discussion around that. Yeah. Please yes, overtake. Uh, and two take on this, points. Yeah. yeah, two points to this as well. Like, you know, when you're really looking at sexual harassment and the reporting of sexual harassment, the two different aspects, firstly the prevalence and the reporting part of it, right? And when you're looking at each organization will go through its own journey. I have been part of a lot of organization where we had a lot of numbers, right? And because of the robust redressal mechanisms, uh, the employees felt that this is, if I file a complaint, there is going to be redressal, that confidence level really rose, which mm -hmm. also acted as a deterrent for other people to not engage in those behaviors as well. And there has been a significant decline and drop in that. Right, so that's number one. So each organization will go through this journey of their crescent troughs as well. That's number one. Second, when you look at these large organizations also, we need to look at the kind of hiring that happens. Sometimes the hiring happens right out of college, where the sensitization on workplace conduct may take its own due course and for them to really understand what is the ethos of the organization, what is acceptable, not acceptable, impact supersedes intent, all of these aspects really go through its own journey. So really understanding these numbers through the organizational perspective is very, very important. Again, when you're looking at the banking, the BFSI sector, the retail uh, banking sector, when you're looking at branches, it goes down to tier two, tier three, tier four cities as well. So the kind of how then sexual harassment takes place in those spaces is again an understanding, a lens that we can't really dismiss when we're having this conversation. The other part of it, a lot of these organizations, I mean, some of these organizations also have gender neutral and all gender inclusive policies. Now, we don't know what these numbers are talk, talking to us right now. Is it only complaints by women or complaints by all genders? Because a lot of time in our experience, 
organization may file their annual reports and report these numbers, which is only specific to people who identify as women. But there could also be cases being filed by non-women employees as well, or non-women folks as well, because a grief woman, a grief person can be any person. Uh, right. So we need to look at those aspects. It's very important that we really deconstruct this data and then understand it and then make meaning of it as well. Right. I think uh, we all agree that there's a huge gap uh, between the reporting cases and the actual cases. But yeah, uh, due to awareness and uh, the companies, how the companies are putting the effort. So they are trying to bridge the gap somehow, but still there's a huge gap. Uh, how how the companies can work more uh, uh, into this, how they can enhance the awareness and uh, accessibility of the policy that is also sometimes even they are not, uh, the employees are not aware about the uh, your internal committee uh, where they should go and report. So uh, what is your uh, take on this? How the companies can uh, create more awareness? I think great question. There's one thing to have a policy and another thing for people to know that there is a policy. So probably, you know, a comprehensive communication strategy would be a great starting point. Uh, again, I'll probably start from the basics. Have a posh policy, which is simple, simple in language, if possible, in a vernacular language, so that even a grass root level employee can understand what's written. Leave aside the legal jargon, talk to people like normal people so that they can understand what's in the policy. This is the easy part. Now comes the more complex part, communicating that policy even to the last person who's standing. And here, companies can use multiple channels. You know, you can have uh, employee handbooks, intranet portals, emails. Now, all employees may not have access to emails, laptops, or smartphones. So I think equally important to conduct training sessions, educate employees about what is sexual harassment, how to report, what is the company's uh, redressal mechanism. In effect, I think there are very simple methods also which are available and effective as well. Posters, flyers, standees, uh, digital screens, all can be put in a common area. You know, just reinforce that visual reinforcement really helps. Uh, probably I'll say, you know, last one or two things saying that the tone from the top is also very important. If the company leaders themselves actively support and promote a culture of tolerance, you know, and when people see their leaders taking these policies seriously, they are also more likely to engage with these policies themselves. Whatever I just said has to be done repeatedly. So regular reminders, regular updates, emails, newsletters, team meetings, internal communications. I think we have to just keep it fresh in the employee's mind. So I'm keeping this short, uh, you know, for some reason to also come in. Uh, yeah, Samuti, exactly. I think uh, Jayant has covered most of the points. Uh, if you can include, uh, you know, uh, having the internal committee, that is fine. But the effectiveness of internal committee, that is also very important. What do you think? Uh, how we can work on the effectiveness of the internal committee in organizations? I think for the benefit of the viewers as well, I think let's just understand what internal committee is, right? So internal committee is a committee that has been constituted under this law to be able to look into complaints of sexual harassment, right? This committee has been given powers of civil court and they have to uphold principles of natural justice. And I'm very intentionally using these phrases and I'll come back to it and tell you why, right? Now, this committee needs to have at least four, four members where the presiding officer is a senior woman employee. The other two members are, again, employees of the organization and the fourth member is an external member. Now, why am I really talking about this? They are employees. The law does not say the employees have to be from a legal background or they need to have experience in this. So when you're looking at really giving them someone authority of a power of a quasi judicial body, like a civil court, they need to understand what that really means, right? Because they do not come from this background. They do not work in this area day in and day out. And that's where constant upskilling of IC members is very important. Uh, they may or may not have handled cases of sexual harassment, right? So to be able to do mocks with them, say a lot of times when sexual harassment takes place, there may not be any evidence. One's word against the other word. How do you really establish it? People sometimes do not when you talk about power civil court to carry out examination, cross-examination. If there's additional evidence, we carry out calling. How do we examine the evidence? What is permissible, not permissible? Now, this is something which is may sound very legal jargonish, can also be very overwhelming. So it's important that we really break it down for them and have these conversations periodically. Right? That comes one piece. Second, now when you're looking at a senior woman employee. That means there are also multiple responsibilities on them. You know, some now because things are also opening up, right? Or people are back to offline, which means a lot of travel. 
business demands, business requirements. We know the kind of you know, economy that we are in right now is booming right now at some places also. So there is a lot of opportunities there as well while having to navigate these responsibilities, which can take anywhere up to 90 days under the law. So to be able to have support from the organization as well becomes very important when there is a complaint filed. You know, and especially the large organizations, do we have ICs at each administrative unit or not? Or how are the ICs constituted? Are they for region? Or one pan-India IC, for example. So really looking at the demand as well there and the kind of pressure they are experiencing becomes very important. Again, when you're talking about this, we're talking about still people who are, you know, part of the organization, they may also know the complainant and the respondent. How do they own, they navigate their own biases as well, uh, why they have received a complaint. And, and I often say that, you know, it's a much more uh, challenging position as an IC, internal IC member than as an external member as well, because I have no preconceived notions. I have no idea about these two people. For me, it's like a blank slate. But for IC members, they are an employee, a friend, a manager, a mentor. Uh, sometimes they also know the family members as well when these cases get reported. And then how do you really navigate through those biases becomes very, very important. So one is in terms of the legal understanding. Second is in terms of their own biases that they may go through. Third is the, the business pressures and to be able to manage those demands, right? So really navigating through all of these spaces becomes very important. And lastly, and more importantly, sexual harassment is the tip of the iceberg. It's a very layered concept, you know, and we cannot have conversation training only on the law if we do not have conversations on privilege, on power dynamics, on consent, on assertiveness, you know, why is it difficult for people to not report immediately? You know, and then ICM has asked these questions, Pehle kyun nahi bola? you know, it's been happening for two years. Why now? You know, just because you've got a negative appraisal yeah. rating, you know, so it's always seen from that perspective, not really able to understand what really came in the way to report it, right? What took them so long to really suffer in silence and stay, and, and how do we bring that shift right now? So the sensitive interviewing as IC members becomes very important. So it's really a large landscape that we're dealing with. And because it's a huge accountability that we hold as IC members, because there's a lot at stake personally and professionally for everyone involved, the individuals, family members, teams, leaders, organizations, it's the entire system that we're working with. I think very beautifully you have covered. Uh, James, one more very important thing is when we talk about the gap in the actual cases and reporting cases, the retaliation. Uh, so if a woman is going to report the case, so maybe she is going to face also the retaliation. What is your take on this? How the organizations can help, uh, you know, to address the retaliation part? Mish, it's a brilliant question. The reason I say this first to begin with is if you were to open the Posh Act or the Posh Rules and you do a quick search, Control F, and look for the word retaliation, you'll be shocked to learn that there is no word retaliation even mentioned in the Posh Act of the Rules. That said, the fact is also that if the IC, as uh, Smriti also you know, quite correctly mentioned, if the IC is well versed with the regulations, they understand, you know, there are certain actions that may look retaliatory, may are retaliatory, could also be included in the sphere of sexual harassment itself. Now, I completely recall sometime last year, there was a PIL in the Supreme Court. And, uh, you know, basically the, the petitioner wanted to bring attention to the fact that there is no provision under the Posh Act when it comes to complainants or the witnesses uh, being protected from retaliation, victimization. You will be surprised Supreme Court dismissed that PIL. And while disposing of the matter, they said, well, you are at the liberty to pursue a legal recourse, which means you can make a representation to the authorities, but we will not look into this. Why? Because a similar matter had already been dismissed by the Delhi High Court. Now that honorable court, and I'm just very quickly, you know, uh, without making it very legal, said that, look, the act does not have anything around retaliation. Today, you are asking us to do something around it, say to add it also as one of the provisions of the act or to make a punishment for retaliation. This means you want to add a new classification of an offense, which never existed. We as courts can't do this. We can only interpret what is mentioned in the law. We can't add on to a law. So because of this, the petition was considered as misconceived. They said, sorry, you know, you can't come to us for this. We can't add retaliation. 
that said a lot of uh, actions for example implicit explicit promise of preferential treatment or explicit threat of detrimental treatment all these things interfering with a person's work creating a hostile intimidating offense uh, environment all of these can also be considered sexual harassment these are retaliatory in nature but are also considered as sexual harassment so in my view if an organization takes a zero tolerance approach to retaliation it is possible both under the posh act as well as their code of conduct and i'm specifically adding this code of conduct because if you think the posh act does not have enough fangs i believe it does then you can also fall back on your code of conduct which will include something like a person who is reporting a matter should not be penalized so together you know we can offer support and protection to an individual who has come forward and reports retaliation from so the retaliation and sometime also some psychological pressure that is you know also uh, very important and you are also psychologist how what is your uh, uh, some tips on this uh i think i'll take on from where jent left it right because when you talking about retaliation we need to un- understand retaliation could happen there multiple people involved right one is a complainant the other are witnesses right third other ic members so when you're talking about retaliation retaliation can happen not only against the complainant but also witnesses and ic members also or at least a perception of it or threats of it so retaliation one it could be the act one is how you're perceiving it and one is also being threatened by it very implicitly also and just like jayant mentioned that there is no word there is no provision for retaliation against the complainant imagine the plight of the witnesses and ic members even though ic members have been given such a huge authority or uh, responsibility under this law there is no provision to even protect ic members as well right and when you're looking at to be able to conduct a fair objective inquiry how does one really do that when there is always this lingering fear of retaliation as a result what happens the witnesses do not want to come in so they turn hostile so either they do not show up or they were say no we didn't see anything we have no comments to make we are unaware uh, right uh, for us we know i we i mean nothing came to a light or i don't remember it results into inconclusive inquiry then yeah even if they have given a statement then they will not acknowledge the statement because they said oh we didn't know it's going to go to the respondent and complain and i never said this right so as an ic it's very important that we do tell them these statements are going to be shared for cross examination but if they do not fathom what that's going to be like then so come on i don't want to cross examine they don't show up at those meetings now the good thing is there was a judgment that came in that you don't have to do cross examination face to face you can do it in writing so that has been very supportive and helpful when it comes to navigating retaliation the ic members have also experienced retaliation they have been messages calls that the ic members have experienced right they felt that someone is calling them incessantly uh they feel they're being stalked uh, outside work as well then how do we really handle these situations because they do not also have evidence can we directly it's a hunch it's a feeling that is coming from there but how do i really establish evidence also right which will come in the way of the way the questioning happens and this is where i'm responding to your question ramesh of how it really plays out psychologically and emotionally because when i know this person is perhaps has a history or i felt threatened by this person as well uh because of certain comments that have been made just before and after in quiet meetings yeah uh, where they've said okay you know so this happened in another organization as well and then uh, you know then there were certain pictures that were leaked for the ic members mm-hmm. and comments being made like that you know to really threaten the ic member that if you do really pursue this very strongly you never know what the outcome is going to be so the next time you're also feeling very vulnerable as an ic member you're also feeling vulnerable as a woman as a person who you know who's you no know, sometimes you no know, in the social media era everything is online right you don't know how things can be misused as well we have heard so many of those uh, situations and conversations around it that will really put them in a situation where the questioning will not happen the way it's supposed to happen uh right it will not stay objective it will not be really calling out the elephant in the room as well in those situations and that's how it really plays out so it's very important so what organizations are doing where, where we consult they have drafted a separate policy on non retaliation and that will encompass all kind of grievances and misconduct because we are looking at creating a psychologically safe workspace anyone 
regardless of the gender they identify with, sexual orientation, disability, caste, anything, they would want to play, put out any concerns or grievances, they can do it. And if anyone uh, threatens them, blackmails them, or there's retaliation against the person filing a complaint or coming in, standing a, with that person, organization will take a strong stand, right? Uh, Jen, uh, you know, this is not gender, uh, gender neutral law. And uh, retaliation is also not covered there. So to offer a fair and uh, you know balanced approach as to the accused person, that is also very important. There are a lot of false cases as well. What the organizations can do to offer the balanced approach to the accused person quickly, if you can share in a couple of minutes. Sure. Uh, I think to begin with, most importantly, when you start an investigation, there should be no prejudgment that the respondent is guilty. Respondent is the person against whom the complaint is filed. Let's not go into an investigation thinking that, oh, this person is definitely guilty. I think that's the first thing to begin with. Give that person at least a chance to prove their innocence. Avoid a confirmation bias where you tend to look for things that support your idea or your uh, position. Second thing, I think we should treat everyone with the same respect and consideration, both complainant or the respondent. I think that's very, very important. You, you should punish a person if they've done something wrong, but I think the respect and consideration should stay. Also, I believe, you know, IC should clearly communicate the rights of the respondent, right to be heard, right to bring evidence, right to know the complete details of the complaint. If there is a list of evidence and witnesses that should be given to the respondent so that they can respond. They also have a right to cross-examine uh, the complainant or the witnesses. Of course, there are nuances around that. Basically, all the things that I just said are mentioned under principles of natural justice. And Ramesh, when you do an investigation under POSH, that is the only guidance which is available in the Act. In fact, in the rules mentioned, when you do the investigation, do it as per principles of natural justice. That is all it says. What I just mentioned is, in a way, the principles of natural justice. I'll just touch upon one very important thing, and probably, you know, uh, Samriti would uh, probably agree with me here. I also believe on offering, you know, counseling support to both the complainant and the respondent as well. All of us have been witness to unfortunate incidents. Those have happened probably at Genpak Noida where, you know, a person was accused of harassment and very, very sadly, they went ahead and committed suicide. It did not have to happen that way. More recently, something similar happened in Gurgaon as well. You know, an entire family is destroyed. So I think the ICs should be better trained to handle queries. These are extremely sensitive matters. So that's in short, you know, an answer of what all can be done or what all should be available to a respondent. Impartial members making sure that you know no one is, uh, you know, has any any conflicts with the complainant or the respondent, and maintaining the privacy, maintaining confidentiality of the accused complainant, so that the reputations are also. Uh, you know, uh, protected all during the process. Probably that's that would be a good start. Right. Uh, I think uh, more women are coming and reporting the cases. That's good. Uh, and the companies still need to work on a little more on the awareness part. Now the technology is also there. So technology can also help in communicating the things and uh, uh, making aware of uh, the employees on this. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Jayant. Uh, and uh, Shambhati for joining the very insightful conversation and sharing your wonderful thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you so much, Ramesh. I appreciate the thoughtful questions and the engaging dialogue we have today. And uh, I think it's very crucial for us to all stay informed and be proactive in addressing this. Thank you, Samriti, for being such a wonderful co-panelist. Thanks a lot.